to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. Joel chapter 2, verse number 13. Welcome to our study of the minor prophets of the Old Testament. Today, specifically, we're going to be thinking about the Pentecost prophet, the prophet that pointed more than any toward that great day in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost, the book of Joel. Today's lesson being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. And this program, The Gospel of Christ, is overseen by the elders of the Central Church of Christ in McMinnville, Tennessee. We'd love for you to stop by and visit the Church of Christ in your area where you'll always find a warm and inviting welcome. Also, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our broadcasts, you can visit us on the website, thegospelofchrist.com. If you'd like to further study or have Bible questions, you can send us an email or contact us at the information at the end of this broadcast. The book of Joel is a very unique minor prophet in that Joel points men and women toward Pentecost. What are some of the main ideas in Joel? Well, the book of Joel is all about the, the desolation, the destruction, the devastation that locusts are going to bring. You've got a chewing, you've got a swarming, you've got a various types of locusts, and those are representative of the enemies who are going to come over and take God's people captive if real repentance and change doesn't occur. Now, we say real repentance because the history of Israel had been such that they were good at outward expressions, the throwing of dust on their head, the pulling the hair out of their beards, the, the tearing of their garments had become a part of Israel's outward symbol of repentance, but God didn't want just that. He wanted real change to occur in their life. Probably the key verse in the whole book that illustrates this idea is Joel chapter 2, and I want you to notice verse number 13. The scripture says, So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and He relents from doing harm. And so the main idea of this book is, yes, captivity, desolation is going to occur, but if you change your heart, if you change your way, God will relent and send mercy and grace in its place. And thus, when we think about Joel, we think of that ever popular phrase that occurs in this book, the day of the Lord. What is the day of the Lord in the book of Joel? Well, in the context of Joel, it is a day when if they don't get ready, if they don't change their ways, ultimate destruction is going to be coming. But you can't help but look forward to the prophecies made as well. That great day in Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, where all the working of God's scheme of redemption, where the plan of salvation, where the blood of Christ was applied to men and women's spirits, when Peter stood up and preached, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly God has made this Jesus, that is the culmination of the day of the Lord. When the Holy Spirit was poured out and when salvation, Acts 2 verse 38, from sin, came to fruition. Now as we think about the book of Joel, one of the key ideas that we'll often find is the need to teach and to instruct. For example, I want you to notice Joel chapter 1 verse number 3. The scripture says, Tell your children about it, 
Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. What's God's message here? God is warning. God is pleading. He's saying, you need to remember what happened. You need to get ready for the day of the Lord. And you need to prepare your children, your grandchildren, and future generations. What's the living message from the book of Joel here? Parents and grandparents have an awesome responsibility to train their children. Do you remember the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 4? Parents, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 22, verses 5 through 7. Train up a child in the way he should go. Over and over again. In Scripture, you've got this admonition. Do you remember Deuteronomy 6, verse 4? When you stand up, when you lie down, when you walk by the way, they're to put God's Word before them. And so parents, like in the book of Joel, Joel chapter 1, verse 3, teach your children about God. Teach your children about the Bible. Help them to, to know those great messages and, and living stories from the Old and New Testament that will bring them to a knowledge of God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as we mentioned, one of the key calamities coming is the locust plague. I don't know if you've ever been anywhere where a true locust invasion occurred, but it is indeed a devastating thing. I can remember when I was a child, several times, maybe in a two, three, four, five year period, there were invasions of grasshoppers. We would know really locusts, but grasshoppers, big long grasshoppers, and anybody who had a garden planted. At night, you might go to bed and the garden might look great. And that locust came, maybe during the night, maybe in the early morning hours, and they chewed everything in that garden. Looked like a, somebody had gone through there with a, a weed whacker. What did they do? Them locusts, they invaded the land. They ate and swarmed and got all over you and your plants and the animals. And, and what's the whole point of this? Is God really saying that these locusts, well, that's the idea, but really the locust invasion is only future of what's going to happen if God's people don't change their ways. This represents devastation. It represents a, a crisis that is designed to awaken Israel. If you think the locusts are bad, wait till the Babylonians come. Wait till the Medo-Persians come. Wait till these people come and invade your land. These locusts aren't anything. What were they designed to do? What are times of crisis, difficulty, and trial designed to do for God's people. Notice some of the things in the book of Joel. For example, Joel chapter 1 verse 5, they were designed to awaken. You know, sometimes if we're not careful, we can kind of get in a slumber. We can kind of get in a, a state where we're just going through the motions and we really don't stop and think about things. They were designed to cause sorrow and lamenting. Chapter 1 verse 8. You look a little further in the book of Joel and they were designed to make the people of Israel ashamed and chapter 2 verse 13 ultimately to bring them to repentance. These difficulties, these locusts, they were designed to get Israel's attention and help them turn back to the true and the living God in every way. And so what a powerful example these locusts set. Now, let's think for just a moment about that key phrase that we find in the book of Joel, and that is the phrase, the day of the Lord. What is this day of the Lord? Well, as you study the book of Joel, it's representative of several things. For example, Joel chapter 1 verse 15, it is referred to as a day of destruction. It's not a day that you want to be there on. It's a day of destruction. God's people are being weighed in the balances and if they don't change, it's not going to be a pretty day. It is a day of darkness and gloom. You can think of days of history where maybe for people today, they were days of darkness and gloom, stock market crash, bombing of Pearl Harbor, the uh, bombing of the Twin Towers on September 11th. All those days are days of darkness and gloom. Historically, bad things happened then. That's what God is trying to express. If changes aren't made, 
This is going to be a very difficult time. It is uh, chapter 2 verse 11. It's described as a, a great and terrible day. Chapter 2 verse 31, a great and awesome day. And then of course chapter 3 verse 14, a day of decision making. Are you really going to put your faith in God? What about these nations and their idols and, and the immorality that it's a, who are you really going to decide to serve? You know, every day that we have indeed is a blessing from God. The scripture says, today is the day the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118 verse 22. And friends, let's be sure of this. Nobody knows the day nor the hour when the Lord is coming, Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36, or when we'll breathe our last. James chapter 4, verse 14, life is like a vapor. And so as we think about this day of the Lord, there's definitely practical application to be made, and it's this. I've got to make sure, and you've got to make sure, we've got to make sure that we're ready at all times to depart and be with the Lord. Anything could happen. Life can change so briefly and abruptly. And yet, are we really ready? Do you remember what Jesus said? Mark chapter 13, verse 35. Jesus said, What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch, be ready. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, I want us to think for just a moment, though, about some of the things that Joel mentions in that key verse, that pivotal verse, Joel chapter 2, verse number 13. Look again at this verse with me. The scripture says, beginning in verse number 12, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and He relents from doing harm. Who knows if He will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind Him, a grain offering and a drink, drink offering, for the Lord your God. What in essence is Joel trying to get across? Yes, the locusts are coming. Something worse. There's a worse day than this coming. But if you'll repent, if you'll change your ways, if you stop doing the, the outward things that make you feel good and really change your heart, then you can be what God wants you to be. I want you to think of several examples of repentance in the New Testament. The need for it is seen. In Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and verse 5, Jesus said to His followers, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Repentance in the New Testament is a change. Acts 3 verse 19, the Bible says, Repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons, so that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repentance is a, a change of heart. Godly sorrow produces repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, like in the days of, of Joel, don't just have the outward, make sure the inward is combined with it. It isn't enough to to, to feel sorry, and as the Jews were doing, tear their garments or pluck the hair out of their beard or throw sack dust in it. No, that wasn't enough. And it isn't enough just to shed tears. Godly sorrow produces repentance. Repentance is a changed will that leads to a changed way. I change the way I think, and then I change the way I act. That's real repentance. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7-10. through 10. Of the Thessalonians, it is said, they turn from idols to God to serve the true and living God. There's real repentance. They stopped looking to idols. Wasn't enough just to do that, though. They then turned in the right direction of God, and they started doing, serving the Almighty in every way. And so real repentance is seen in this text and how we desperately need changes in action, not just outward symbols of repentance today. Now, one of the things that we do learn from the book of Joel is this. Although God promises that destruction is near, restoration and hope 
are around the corner for those who repent. You know, with God's warning and with God's pleas, God also gives a, a way of escape for those who are willing to follow Him. Notice Joel chapter 2, verse number 25. The Scripture says, Concerning God's willing to restore, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. What's God trying to say here? Yes, there was devastation. Yes, it was designed to awaken and help put you in the valley of decision in essence, but I'm not going to leave you there. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you high and dry, God says. If you're willing to repent, I will restore. Friend, what a, a powerful message of love and hope that is as well in the New Testament. Remember Acts 3 verse 19 again? Repent and turn so that your sins may be blotted out. Now watch this. So that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When God said, rend your hearts, not your garments, God also said, I'll restore what's been taken away. Friend, the principle is very clear. If I'm willing to change my ways, and if I'm willing to put my trust in God, and if I'm really willing to do what He says, God also promises again, to restore and to bless. Isn't that a powerful message? Friend, think about the person who is in Christ. All spiritual blessings are His. Ephesians 1 verse 3, He has forgiveness, He has hope, He has joy, He has peace that passes all understanding, He has the, the communion with God and others as He walks in the light. 1 John 1 verse 7, All that was taken away through sin can and will be restored in Christ for those who obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, one of the great texts that we see in the book of Joel, we often refer to as the Pentecost prophecy. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 30, is repeated by Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Notice the words of Joel 2, verse 28 through 30. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out My Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see vis visions. And also on My men servants and on My maid servants, I will pour out My Spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Now, what is this message of Pentecost? Well, again, as we think about the prophecy, and as we think about the things that are said to come, you've got to first consider it in the context. In the context, God is showing through very graphic restoration language, like used in Isaiah, times in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, this is a, a type of figurative language where in the context God is showing His people all that's been taken away is going to be restored graphically. And yet, this text, which first applied to Joel's hearers, also is further applied down the stream of time on the day of Pentecost. Let's turn there and notice the rest of that. Look in Acts chapter 2 with me, and I want you to notice what the Bible says beginning in verse number 17. The Scripture says, beginning in verse 14, Peter standing up with the eleven on the day of Pentecost raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Now watch this. For these, the eleven who stood up and spoke in languages they'd never studied. These are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. It's only nine in the morning. But, what is it then, Peter? But, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes on to mention Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 21, a direct quote from Joel 2, verse 28 to 30. Well, what's going on here? The eleven, they stood up as the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them as they spoke in unknown languages, languages unknown to them that they never studied. 
this was an amazing thing. And, and some people said they're drunk. How can they be babbling? How, how's this happening? Peter said, no, they're not drunk. This is the fulfillment of that day of the Lord spoken about in Joel chapter 2. Just as there was restoration, just as hope, just as renewal was given in Joel chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, the greatest hope and renewal ever given occurred. And that is forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. You know, to really understand the prophecy of Joel 2 and its fulfillment in Acts 2, we need to look at the end result in Acts chapter 2. Remember, Acts 2 verse 36 comes to a climax. Peter says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. How did they respond to that? Acts 2 verse 37, When they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And here was the answer. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those who gladly received His word were baptized, Acts 2 verse 41 through 43, and for the very first time, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. There's the ultimate fulfillment of the promises in Joel chapter 2 that the gift of salvation through Jesus would occur. Now, Joel does mention something very interesting in Joel chapter 3, though, and it is a very practical point for us today. Look in Joel chapter 3, verse number 14. The Scripture says this, Multitudes, Joel says, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Just like in the days of Joel, isn't it true today that there are so many who are standing, multitudes, standing in that valley of decision, haven't said no, haven't said yes, probably understand, probably have seen, surely are committed to some truths about Christ in the Bible, and yet they really haven't made their self availed of the promises and the blessings in Christ. Maybe some are standing there and they're saying to themselves, someday, yeah, I believe these things, but someday I'm going to do that. Friend, how do you know? Someday will come. Acts 24, verse 25, Felix said, go away for now. When I've got a more convenient time, I'll call upon you. Acts 26, verse 28, Agrippa said, almost. I'm not sure if that convenient time or that almost ever came. If it's a maybe, why not go ahead and make that decision? If you've been thinking about it, why not obey the gospel? What, what are you waiting on? Time is not in our favor. Some have already made a decision, and that decision is, in essence, no. By the way, they're living their life. If you're living in sin, even if you believe in Jesus, friend, you've decided, no, by your life. Change your ways. That's God's message. Return to Him. Let God, through His mercy and grace and the blood of Jesus, help you with that problem. One final message that we definitely want to address from the book of Joel and Acts chapter 2 because it is such a, a devastating false doctrine. We want to deal with this as well. In Joel chapter 2 verse 32, the scripture says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter quotes this in Acts chapter 2, verse 21, verbatim, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And yet, in the context of Joel and in the context of Peter, people often quote that out of the context and misuse it. They will say, all you've got to do to be saved is just call on the name of the Lord. And by that, mean, they mean maybe saying some prayer that Billy Graham put together a long time ago or, or just saying, I believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. Does that fit with what we see with the rest of us? Is that what's being talked about? Matthew 7 verse 21 teaches us clearly it is not what Jesus taught. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father 
in heaven. It's not enough just to say, Lord, you've got to do what Jesus said. Well, what does it really mean to call on the name of the Lord? You know, my friend, the greatest way to example the, uh, to answer this is to let the Bible define its own terms. I'm thankful that we have the book of Acts for it. It helps us to understand more about conversion and passages like these. What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Well, let's turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 2, or excuse me, Acts chapter 22 and verse number 16. And let's see, how did a man in the Bible who obeyed the gospel call on the name of the Lord? Here's the best divine commentary on this. Look in Acts 22, verse 16. The Bible says, Ananias came to Saul and said, Why are you waiting? Verse 16, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Don't miss this. Calling on the name of the Lord. How does a person, according to the Scripture, Call on the name of the Lord. Is it saying the sinner's prayer? No, you don't find that in the Bible. Is it just throwing your hands up in the air and saying, I believe it? No, Jesus said that's not what it is. Matthew 7, 21. What does it mean? Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, here's the illustration. Man is steeped in sin. He, he's drowning in it. He's suffering in it. And, and he calls out. To God for help. Call Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so here's man. He's stuck in sin. He's crying out to God for help. And God extends that salvation. The moment man cries out, is he saved? No. He's got to do what God says. What is that? Don't miss Acts 22, 16. Saul arose and was baptized, having called on the name of the Lord. How do you call the name of the Lord? You get up and do what God says to be saved. People have to hear the Word. Romans 10, verse 17. You must believe in Jesus, no doubt. John 8, 24. The Joel, book of Joel illustrates repentance must occur. Acts 2, verse 38. You've got to make the good confession. Romans 10, verse 10. And just as Saul illustrated, you must arise and be baptized and wash away your sins having. That's how you call on the name of the Lord. Friend, we ask you today to consider, are your ways, are my ways, are we in line with the will of God? Are our lives what they ought to be? If not, be sure there is a day coming. I'll give an account and you'll give an account. May we all be ready for that great day by obeying the gospel of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.